Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please be seated. I love that we live in the northern hemisphere, far enough above the equator that we have seasons, and that with any luck, Easter comes to us as it does this year when flowers and shrubs and trees are just beginning to bloom. It is as if nature conspires with God in presenting to us the gospel on the subject of new life bursting forth before our eyes on the subject of the resurrection. You know, when something extraordinary happens, you know, like in Luke's gospel today, when a person whose life had come to an abrupt and ignominious end miraculously comes back to life, well, when we encounter extraordinary occurrences that we may have never seen before, we often exclaim, I can't believe it. Or we say to one another, you won't believe it, but I saw it with my own eyes. Some of you may have been to Lake Atitlan in Guatemala. It is a lake nestled in a crater surrounded by three volcanoes not far from the colonial capital, Antigua. It's a stunningly beautiful place, and fun, too, for there are many places in this lake wherein there are warm channels of water, the water being heated from veins of lava in the volcanoes that surround it, where the, these warm channels of water jet up from the bottom of the lake like a giant hot springs. Around the lake, there is a road. A friend of ours, Marco Antonio Ortiz, took us there for a visit. And on that country road that runs the circumference around the lake, as he was driving us, he pulled sort of into a valley, a dip in the road that elevated on one side and then the other. And at the bottom of the valley, <clears throat> he paused and simply turned off the car and put the gear in neutral and wait. Within a few seconds, the car started to roll uphill. It was like an out-of-body experience. I mean, and so, and I said, I can't believe it, this can't be true. Everything I know about the gravitational pull of the Earth tells me that a car can't roll uphill. And yet, we continued for several minutes to roll uphill. In that moment, my perspective changed. Everything I had learned kind of went out the window. I began to question that and other things, but new possibilities from that experience emerged for me. Now, there's this little known brand of tequila <laughs> produced in Jalisco, Mexico. It's called Los Cazadores. I have seen it on shelves in California, but not, not on shelves around here. So Stephen and I were touring the fields of agave plants and watching them be harvested. And I had noticed that when we had been picked up by this foreman in his pickup truck, that this Mexican foreman, in his cab of his truck, had classical music playing. And I found this kind of odd, because having traveled around Mexico, mostly what I encountered in, on the radio and on the streets and in restaurants was some version of mariachi music. So after our tour of the fields, we were taken to the processing and fermenting plant where the tequila was made. And when we entered the plant, classical music was playing there also. Hmm, I recognized Vivaldi. So after touring sort of the different processes in the plant, we climbed some steel stairs 
and peered into the vats of fermenting tequila. And we were explained, and it was explained to us by the foreman that the fermenting process takes about three days, about 72 hours. But they had found that when they played Vivaldi in the fermenting room, that in fact, the fermenting process was speeded up by at least two hours. <laughs> they had even experimented, and they had played Beethoven and Mozart. And Beethoven and Mozart, well, that they could speed the fermentation by about an hour, but nothing like Vivaldi. And the Four Seasons, that was the best. The other thing, when we were standing um, at the top looking into these vats that was explained to us, was that when Mozart and Beethoven were played, the microbes circled in the vat in a counterclockwise way. But when they played Vivaldi's Four Seasons, the microbes switched directions and went clockwise and faster. An unbelievable story. Unbelievable. Now, I did watch some microbes swirling to Vivaldi, but who would believe this? You wouldn't believe it, but I saw some of it with my own eyes, and I heard the testimony of so many people. But I was still a little bit skeptical, so when we got to the scientific room there at at this fermentation plant, I went in and spoke to the scientist. And she told me that, in fact, everything that I had been told was real and true. She confirmed it. Believe it, she said. You know, I wonder if Easter would be so powerful for us, for me, if I lived in the southern hemisphere, well below the equator, say in Buenos Aires. And this Easter gospel came at a time when the deciduous trees were losing their leaves and nature was getting ready to hibernate for the winter. Would this gospel seem as powerful? Would the power of the proclamation of new life and of resurrection be more muted in the midst of environs that were closing down for the winter or perhaps dying? Or might it be even more powerful to proclaim life and love and forgiveness in the midst of that kind of shutting down or death? It reminds me of those two men in dazzling clothes there at the tomb when those three women went to see if Jesus was there, if his body was there. And they said to the three women, why do you look for the living among the dead? Why do we look for the living among the dead? I think it's because if we believe in this God that is so powerful and so loving and so present to us, even when nothing else is conspiring to bring new life, God continues to bring new life. Like the enigmatic gravitational pull on a road around Atitlan that can open up for us new possibilities, what of the possibilities that are open to us because of this resurrection that we celebrate today? What other resurrections do we then embrace as possible? How do we let the new life burst forth and trust the resurrection? I am especially wondering, in the midst of death, how it is that God redeems us and situations to bring new life. If God's mysterious ways can make a car roll uphill or move microbes faster in new directions in a fermenting vats of agave juice to the tune of Vivaldi, well, what else can God do 
especially with our own hearts. You know, our Lenten series this year, we explored the work of a theologian, Joel Marcus. We read together his book, Jesus and the Holocaust. It was a heavy subject, um, and in fact, was a, sort of an example of what I'm proposing to you here today. Asking the question, where is, is God? Where is this new life that bursts forth in the midst of tragedy and death? We were privileged to have Joel Marcus come here to the parish last week and teach us on a Friday night and a Saturday morning. So in his book, he quotes the famous Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel, who was speaking at a commemoration of the liberation of Auschwitz at a gathering there at Auschwitz. And this is what he said. Even though we know that God is full of mercies, still we pray to you, O God, do not have pity on those who established this place. God of forgiveness, do not forgive the murderers of Jewish children. And he goes on to describe what several who were gathered there that day witnessed, especially with the children. He says, if we could see just one of them, it would break our heart. And asks, but did it break the heart of the murderers? And so then he prays, O oh God, O oh merciful God, do not have pity on those, those who did not have pity on our Jewish children. The Holocaust was about as dark. Well, we have other genocides, unfortunately. But it was about as dark a day and a time as we've experienced on this earth in the last couple of hundred years. It is completely understandable that a survivor, a mere human being, could pray such a prayer. I mean, who would forgive? The prayer is honest and believable. And yet there is another prayer that I found written down and found in a pocket of the clothing of a child who did not survive at Ravensbrück concentration camp. And in it there is a lot to hear, a lot about forgiveness and a lot about love. This child prayed, O oh Lord, remember not only the men and women of goodwill but also those of ill will. But do not remember, O oh Lord, all of the suffering they have inflicted upon us. Instead, remember the fruits we have borne because of this suffering. Our fellowship, our loyalty to one another, our humility, our courage, our generosity, the greatness of heart that has grown from this trouble. And then she goes on to pray to God. When our persecutors come to be judged by you, let all of these fruits that we have borne be their forgiveness. Today we get to proclaim the Lord is risen with these beautiful flowers around us, some of which came from out of doors that we love and that conspires to make this a joyous day. But I'm beginning to think, especially after our group that Doug did this study in Lent, that the deeper message of Easter, while, while it is a message of hope that we cling to, is a message of hope that clings to us even in the darkest times. So I think, my friends, that story is the story of the power of love the power of forgiveness 
and the power of God in the resurrection. And so I urge you, as I urge myself, believe it. There is not a place wherein you will find yourself and any time when you walk on this earth where God is not present, taking what you have been given at any moment in time and redeeming it for God and for good. So whether the world seems to be conspiring to bring new life or careening into the abyss of darkness, sin, and death, believe in the resurrection live as a resurrection people. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.